Yes, uh, thanks of all things, Simon, for warming the audience. <laughs> um, so I'm Manu. I'm uh, working at Microsoft as a um, software engineer. And what I'm doing for a living is working with customers and partners uh, and helping them doing the digital transformation <laughs> uh, to the cloud world and to the serverless world. And um, why I choose this title is um, people doing a lot of things with serverless technologies, what they shouldn't do. And think about, um, so consider this talk as kind of a self-therapy for myself and um, giving you the best advice, which pitfalls you really should avoid. So first of all, uh, serverless is, as you might all know, not this yeah, it's new. Yeah, you should use it, but it's it's not the, the technology everybody says, go for it, build everything with it. This is your, your new holy grail and forget everything you already know about. So that's definitely not the case, but what I saw, people have the idea that this is now changing the whole world, yes, but it's not changing your legacy systems out of the box magically. No, it's not. So that's why I really want to give you some idea what you should not do with it. Just a couple of things you should consider when building uh, new systems or traversing old systems to the serverless world. Good, so um, I have a couple of scenarios. First of all, who of you is using serverless technologies um, or have put hands on it? Maybe nearly all of you, who is using um, serverless for production applications, for production code, and who is super, super happy with it and didn't have any problems till then? Yeah, two, thank you, okay. <laughs> Good, so what I saw before is um, there are two types. The first is the, the hurtful type. You started um, building this thing, yeah? you read the documentation, started, and um, then you created something which kind of works. It does the job, but then you say, okay, uh, no, it's, it's not working that good. Chaos came into place because you, you put things together which shouldn't be placed together. Yeah, and what you did then erased everything and you, go, uh, you, you um, went on with technology you already know of because you don't have that much time. You don't have that much money, which comes into place. Um, uh, with, with with each other, and um, yeah, you just went with your tech you already know. The second one is, um, yeah, this thing, okay, it's there on some platforms, wherever you use it, it's it's not GA already, so it's kind of in preview, things not work out that well, the um, debugging mechanisms, for example, and the coding tools are not there yet, like in the technology you are, um, you are already firm with. And yeah, basically you tried it out and deleted it anyway and said, okay, I have a look at it in one or two years, but that's not the, not, not, not the thing I can use right now. And uh, the last thing is, you may, may have missed something during development, made an error, I don't know, put things together in uh, not the common way. And then, uh, like Simon said before, something happened on the cost side. And I don't know if you uh, heard of the story of um, a guy who um, dived into serverless, built his uh, application, uh, quite a small one, just a proof of concept thing, deployed it, was super happy with it, and uh, then went on vacation for two weeks. When he came back and checked his emails, he saw that this little mini function he deployed was already at a forecast at $83. So it should do just a, a little task, but it already generated a lot of money. And um, just from a, from, a, from a perspective side, one million executions of functions just cost 20 cents. So something happened there. Yeah? So when he then um, updated the um, current cost, pro, um, the uh, current cost analysis, he already had a forecast of $800. So actually for a job which does not that much. And yeah, what was the problem? Um, the function he deployed was really just um, 
blob triggered, so a file was saved into a blob storage. This triggered the function. This did a job, wrote me metadata back to this very blob, changed the blog, blob. This triggered the function again, and you know what happened. Yeah? So he generated a lot of money, or a, a, a lot of costs, basically. It was just $200 in the end. So this is a, a quite low-risk thing in his case because he noticed it quite, um, quite, quite fast. But was, what was missing and what generated this high costs for him were just a return statement because he already knew that this endless loop can take place. And that's why when the metadata changed and were already there, then he would return. But that's what he forgot in the last development step to put it back in. So just a little, a very, very little coding error can cost you a lot of money. But just keep it in mind. Okay, so um, what you really need to know is, or maybe already know, so serverless is not the holy grail to your system architecture. Um, most of you are not starting on a greenfield. You are confronted with serverless, um, with already having some, some systems in place. You are already develop, you are maintaining, and just because it's there and it's auto-scaled and it does a lot of things for you out of the box, it doesn't mean that your system architecture is getting better just by using it. It's not. Um, the next thing is that it's definitely a nice toolbox for um, creating loosely coupled, nicely working, auto-scaled applications, but it's not the fluffy tool which solves your uh, design problems within your application. So this is a thing you have to still think about a lot, like always in software development, um, about, your, um, about your, your design of your application and the architecture of it. And the last one is, um, it doesn't help reduce your system's complexity. Absolutely not. Because in... Um, in the worst case, it might even make things more complicated. Because back then, or not back then, a lot of people are still having the systems in place. You have this monolithic application. And I think about, let's say, it was 10 years ago, everything was, um, so the, the buzzword, which is serverless or Jeff right now, was containers back then. So everything needs to be containerized because it's cool. You have everything in one package. You can deploy it somewhere, can give it easily to somebody else. So the, the distribution was nicer. But did it really improve your applications on an architecture basis? Maybe not, maybe. But it didn't do something magically out of the box. And this is what serverless doesn't take care of. So you still have to do this on your own on a very responsible way. So what serverless actually is for me is um, so um, I think Paul mentioned it in a in a in, in a in a blog post of of him that serverless is a system which doesn't cost you a thing when it's not running and when it's not used except storage. Yeah? That's a good good way to to understand it. But for me, it's really just a software engineering pattern. It's a thing you use to build your whole application around it. So it's, it's then in, in, in the DNA of your application. It's like using a new framework for your new application, for example. It's really built in then. You're building your application around it. It's not just, OK, uh, the framework is discontinued. Um, no one will maintain it anymore. And then you have it there, and you just can't rip it out and put something else in without having a lot of effort and maybe rewriting or, or, or changing your application on a really big scale. And this is happening with serverless too. So, which brings me to the no guide. <laughs> um, what you shouldn't do with serverless. So, I have three scenarios which I saw that a lot of customers um, had the idea that they want to do exactly this with this new technology. So. They have their production systems, they have their running systems, the whole business is running on those things. And now they heard of it, now they want to get cloud ready. And getting cloud ready, the best way is to let the platform maintain a lot for them or manage a lot for them to really get the best out of the cloud. So it's not just moving things over and um, just using the, the whole infrastructure of a cloud platform. So really just using all this 
um, a software as a service thing in addition and put the own application in functions to really have it uh, running on a serverless basis. So people have their legacy systems come to us and say, we want to make it serverless. So the whole, the whole thing. Yeah? So what you really want to do is take your hammer, hit it hard, this old system, put up the pieces, and put the pieces into separate functions, and then just connect them together. And then they think it's um, the, the new running application, which is now super future-proof. So they're safe now. OK, nothing can happen to them. So when they get told that they have to rewrite a lot of it, and this is the same as they, they wanted to, to kind of rewrite their application or, or refactor a lot of it, it's the same when you transform over your current system to a serverless architecture, because you have to change your whole architecture to, to, to do this if you want to have serverless in the core of your, your application. Um, the next scenario is the greenfield idea. So customers um, who don't have a legacy here, it's mostly startups, um, are coming to us and say, OK, we don't have anything to take care about. We are free. Let's build something awesome. So they are building their, their whole system on the new serverless basis and doing really, literally all serverless with no real architecture in mind, just what they need, put them in place, glue it together, and then it mostly looks like something like this. So all features they um, want to put into place are deployed in single functions, um, trigger them together, really using all the platform offers them, really everything, and then have this chaotic ball of hell. Yeah? So. The good thing is they don't have to take care of the maintenance of it, so on on the um, so, so so under the hood, because it's auto scaled for them. Uh, they can attach it to their CI CD loops. Everything's nice, and they have the system which runs. Okay, and then they have it run for a month or two, and then they knock on the door again and say, "Oh, that's much ex much more expensive than we already thought." And wouldn't it be cheaper to just use everything in one ball on a VM? And I say, OK, hi. <laughs> you can do this, but you maybe did serverless wrong. So that's exactly not the way you should do it also. And um, the last one is the, the agile people. So I, I really love developing in an agile way or um, yeah, living in an agile um, environment. It's a good thing, but it's not a good thing when you're doing things like this. So you're starting with an idea. You have a rough idea of what, what will be your first MVP you want to launch. And this is what you're doing in the we do every, everything serverless way. So just put everything together in this one kind of product ball. Then you launch this. And afterwards, because we're agile, we say, OK, now this part needs to be torn out because it doesn't work. Let's put another feature in there. And then you have this, this construct of different serverless balls, which are then talking with each other. Not a good way also. So is there a yes guide? Um, basically, yes and no. So there is no recipe at all where I would say to, to, to customers and partners, these two or three scenarios, always serverless, because you can't say that. It's, it's everything the same in tech. It always depends. It really always depends. So what we really have as a, in, as a, as a feature set, actually, is those five things, I guess, really summarize it nicely together. So serverless is really always stateless. Huh? You can fake it, yes, you can write some state information down somewhere, yeah. But think of it really as having no state. The second one is they're always loosely coupled. So they are running on their own in, in, in their own little runtime world, are fired up when they are needed, and they're shut down when they are not needed. And put little parts of code really into one execution, 
uh, one, one executed function and the next one also and do the separation of concerns in a very responsible way. So don't just, as the, 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 the legacy example showed, don't just throw a hammer on an idea and then pick up the pieces and put it into functions. So really think what is really needed to be together because it's running on a stateless and loosely coupled way. The third thing is the, the thing because everybody wants to do it because they don't have so much trouble with it. So it's fully managed on most platforms. You always have this um, from logging into the portal or firing up your bash or using your script. So really from starting with creating a new function to it runs, you have deployed everything. It's mostly just a couple of minutes. And then afterwards, you don't have to take care of scaling, of making it available to, um, yeah, being just there in work, so the platform does it for you. So that's the super big advantage of the whole thing. But on the other side, there's the cost issue, um, which we will talk about in a couple of seconds. Um, okay, um, at the end, costs, 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 everywhere the same. It's nice when a technology works exactly like you need it, but you have to be able to afford it, right? Good, so the basic two tips I have for everybody is think about architecture, think hard about architecture, and think about costs. Those two things are really the key essential ideas you have to really think hard of when you use serverless. Because on the architecture side, you have to think about um, what, what latency I'm I, I, I can accept for my, for my application. What can I tolerate for the functionality of my product to have latencies between different um, function or different features, actually? And that brings me to consistency because when you spread your functionality around different functions, you have to keep consistency somewhere because you want to, persist, um, to, to save data somewhere. So think hard where you put those those things. And um, the um, availability thing is basically pretty easy when you say it needs to be available all the time. Even when I use, for example, the function for a little feature which is used from a mobile app, the mobile app gets featured, user numbers through the roof, everything's nice, yeah, app works well. On the other hand, the function is called, scaled out enormously for you that it works which brings you to the cost side again. So this whole availability issue, so your need for availability is um, basically creating a cost issue for you. So just keep this in mind. And um, yeah, then the last one, I'm getting not tired of mentioning it, this need for state. Um, keep in mind that there is really no, no state intended there. Good, and then the cost side, um, it's basically things you you have to consider pretty hard, like how many users do you really think, or users, um, how many calls do you think the function will get? So just do a little estimation. Is it really a function which will have um, a lot of usage in certain times and then it idles, stays, or is it really used on a very continuous basis? because this brings you to um, another decision you have to make on a cost plan. Then you can save or spend a lot of money. Good, then um, I think it's better to just have a look at, at pictures because most of us are more visuals. So there are two ways you can, yeah, um, you, can, you can pay back your, your uh, deeds to the platform. There is a consumption plan idea and there is um, a service idea. So I took the example from Microsoft Azure. So the standard is pay as you go. As often as your function is needed or called, you're paying for the duration, how long the function runs, and basically the memory it uses. So those are the two factors which, um, which makes the, the, the dollars which you have to pay at the end of the month. So this means when the function is called a lot, it's scaled for you, that your availability you really want to have from it is hit. 
that's nice, but that means you have to pay all of it. Sure. So that's the consumption plan. It really grows with the need and then shrinks when it's not needed. Nice. And you don't have to do a thing, actually. So that's consumption. On the other hand, there is um, something called app service plan where you have the full cost control. But on the downside, just limited scalability. But you have to, yeah, you have to to take the risk on this one when you use the app service plan. What it does is you just um, select the plan which you think fits to your estimation you did before. So how often is my function called? And when you have a very continuous flow of usage, then you should use basically an app service plan because you know you have, for example, in a basic plan, four CPUs, 16, gig, uh, 16 gigs RAM, and um, two instances at max. So you can actually estimate, okay, my function is called 1,000 times a day, then the basic plan is nice, and I really just have to pay, for example, my 25 euros a month. It's not getting more. It's not less, though, also, because you can shut down it, so you have to pay it. And um, it doesn't scale for you, so that's the downside. And you have to go back to the consumption plan. So you can have full cost control on the one side, and you can have the full availability and scalability on the other side, which you have to pay then. So that's what I meant with you really have to think about how your functions are used and how they are calling each other and how you really want to, to get them in place in your architecture. Good. And um, for this reason, AWS, for example, um, launched this little website, it's called Servos Lol. Um, it's really awesome, you just enter a couple of, infor um, couple of, of pieces of data f which describes the way you want to use serverless or lambdas, and then um, the mechanism um, tells you, no, don't use it, because your costs would be completely insane, or use it in those ways. So that's like a decision-helping mechanism, actually, um, that you can get a feeling with what's my idea and does the idea fit the technology or the other way around. Does the technology fit my needs? So, and as Microsoft is lacking a cool service like this, I draw you something. So um, this is a kind of mini-helping uh, diagram for, for decisions in um, the lower quarter. So we have duration and we have memory. So those are, those are the two factors which are basically there um, for um, yeah, setting up the costs. When you're in the lower quarter, everything is nice. This is serverless. Serverless is for you. You have short running functions which doesn't use a that great amount of, um, of memory. I think until one gig, everything is fine. It's not that costly. And, um, but when you have a low memory function, for example, so low memory functionality you want to implement, and it should run very long, for example, a couple of minutes, or exceed this, um, this magical limit of three to five minutes, because then your function is just cut out, it's shut down, that's, that's the limit for it. When you have long running, um, long running functionalities, serverless is not for you anyways. So you have to think of something where you deploy the functionality elsewhere. And, um, when you have short running functionality, um, sh short running functions which use a lot of memory, if you're rich, go for it. Thank you. <laughs> but um, just otherwise, you might have a coding error somewhere, or the tech is not for you too. And the fourth quarter is yeah, wrong choice, anyways. So drop it. Good. And um, with this little helper in place, thank you.